Welcome back to Telos of EV with Mike as well. Hi. And we're very excited here today to learn more about Tello trucks. Curious because we know there's a lot of demand for all electric pickup trucks, but one of my biggest issues with them that lots of people bring up is they're too big, the size. We'd love to hear some of your backstory and kind of where you're at in the development phase for trying to figure out how to make utility focused still portable you know yeah. so i'm jason marks i'm the ceo of tello trucks we're building electric mini trucks crew cab pickup trucks with tesla range the size of a two-door mini cooper trucks specifically for tight narrow cities and suburbs hard to reach places really where size does matter trucks have gotten just absolutely too big mm -hmm. and the funny thing is it actually wasn't always the case. Mm -hmm. like in the early 2000s and 1990s, the two-door Ford Ranger, the Toyota SR5, that was, SR5, yeah, one, of those. <laughs> that was one of the more best-selling vehicles in America. Wow. And now it's the Ford S series, which if you look at it, on average, is the size of three king-size mattresses end-to-end. -end. <laughs> it's, like, it's like hard yeah. to conceptually believe. Like 20 feet is a lot since it's a big vehicle. And it's actually a weird situation that happens. So it's not really consumer demand that pushed automakers to build them big. It's actually a reaction from the Environmental Protection Agency's mm -hmm. laws. Force automakers' hands at building bigger vehicles. The story goes, in the 1970s, the EPA was established because of the gas crisis. Force automakers build more efficient vehicles. Mm -hmm. They exempted trucks. Everyone started building trucks. Right. That was like, they called SUVs trucks, and that's yeah. the way it was. But then in 2010, the EPA said, okay, enough of this, guys. <laughs> we're going to start applying those rules to trucks. Mm -hmm. But we're going to make it so the bigger the truck you build, the more lenient it is. All the automakers, instead of trying to spend a lot of time, energy, and money trying to make their vehicle, their trucks more fuel efficient and maybe cutting down their their toughness and manliness, right. they built them bigger. And they all kind of sit now at that same exact footprint. That's where the EPA kind of like says, okay, no more advantages to going any bigger. Right. This is all how we're going to kind of- They found that ideas. fulcrum point between exactly. big, low uh, standards for efficiency. Exactly. So gotcha. now every single automaker builds that size vehicle. The crazy thing that happened was electric vehicle companies that came out, they went, okay, we want to electrify a pickup truck. Let's just take what they already created mm. and let's make that electric. That's kind of the opposite of what should have happened. It should have been like, why were these vehicles created? Oh, there's a huge opportunity to do this in a much more efficient way because we're not beholden to those same EPA standards. We're electric. But so the downstream consequences of this are, are really kind of astronomical. Like when you take a 6,000 pound pickup truck and you add 3,000 pounds of battery to it, mm -hmm. you get a vehicle that's no more efficient than a small gas car is. Right. True. You get a vehicle that weighs 10,000 pounds. Trucks are already three times more likely to kill pedestrians than any other vehicles on the road. Pedestrian deaths are at an all time high currently. It's scary. So it's, it's yeah. crazy. They were steadily decreasing until 2008, and guess what happened? 2010, whether it's coincidence or not, I don't uh -huh. know, skyrocketed up. All time high now. Over almost 10,000 people or pedestrians who have been killed on the road in 2023. That's really sad. And I noticed when I travel internationally that you don't see trucks the size of F 150s and Silverados. Like, it's much more common to see smaller Tacoma sized yep. pickups it, it, whenever it you travel those, internationally. Even those like Hilexus, which is the number one best selling truck outside of the US, it's really not that small. Mm. It's still. 18 feet long. Maybe it's not, the hood's not this tall anymore. Right. It's still a big vehicle. Yeah, yeah. So if you walk in here, you go, this is our first drivable vehicle. This is really what we call a test bed. Okay. What you're looking at is a vehicle that represents a lot of the things that we were trying to prove out in our first iteration, mm -hmm. but built into that same footprint. So this blue rectangle on the ground, that's okay. the length and width of a two door Mini Cooper. Oh, gotcha. So everything we've done fits inside of that blue box. That's really, although it's not positioned correctly, but that's really where yeah, it is. Yeah. And you'll see that when you get into the vehicle, you have a chance to climb all over it and everything. That is but, really is the same utility as a full-size pickup. So we've got cool. five seats. Yeah, I've got your classic bench seat in the back. These, these have the same leg and headroom, actually just a hair more than my Toyota Tacoma does. Wow. And when you fold down the seats, Ooh. this is a mid-gate, you've got a full eight-foot bed with the tailgate up. Wow. So this fits a four by eight sheet of plywood in. And even with this folded up, you still get a five foot bed in here. And you get off-road tires, 10 inches of ground clearance, eight inches of suspension travel. It's a truck with a real load capacity, Man. real performance, four wheel drive, everything you want in the utility of a truck, but in the footprint of a two-door Mini Cooper. That's impressive. We like to joke that it's, we've got big truck energy. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. This is the same <laughs> past capabilities of a truck. Like you still use this for work. Right. And if you've got a family and they all have mountain bikes, like. This is perfect for you. How much of this is using production off the shelf versus just the prototype? So our core IP 
But what we do special mm -hmm. is our battery technology okay. and our safety technology. So my co-founder is a, a battery expert. He was on the very first Tesla team. Mm -hmm. Tesla actually started a couple blocks that way. Oh, wow. And the, nice. the founder of Tesla, his son, was our intern two summers ago. Oh, cool. So, um, Fun. He is really the, one of the premier experts in battery technology. So we built yeah. a battery pack that has an energy density in, the, in like volumetrically, so space efficiency, significantly better than anything else in the road right now. Wow. That's why we can package a 106 kilowatt hour battery pack in this footprint. That gives us that 350 mile range. Why 106 kilowatts? Because that's what we could fit. <laughs> why not less? What my line's going around is you're marketing towards like urban environments. Why do you need 350 miles of range? It's very much the case that the US consumer feels that 300 miles is really a threshold to hit for a lot of them. We've interviewed a ton of people and that's really the threshold of like, it makes sense to move over to an EV. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, a lot of the construction companies, contractors that we are talking to that we're looking to sell vehicles to, they actually don't have their facilities parked in the downtown areas. Even mm -hmm. though they work in downtown areas, they could be 45 miles up to 150 miles away. They have to get to and from their specific locations. That is really core. Even though they're spending all their time and energy parked in downtown San Francisco, getting to and from downtown San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Enough know, range to get into town and get out. Exactly. You know, for us, being, yeah. they, like, just, just me personally, I live in downtown San Francisco. I want to go to Tahoe. Sure. So that's really what, what I wanted. No, right. I understand. There's definitely an appeal. It's just what I understand in the background is the battery being one of the most expensive components, if not the most expensive. Is there intentions on having multiple battery pack trims or are you just kind of 100 kilowatt hours, that's it for well, all of them? Well, just think about this. The average price for a pickup truck in the U.S. What, do you guys know the answer to this? What, what that number is? It's 60000 right? 60000 $60,000 okay. is the average cost of a pickup truck. And we're coming yeah. in at $50,000 before incentives. You know, we don't want to have a pricing war. We don't think that's really what's a good thing for the consumer. We want to have a war on giving them a vehicle that it's purposeful for the use case that consumers and commercial applications will want. The fact that we're in this small footprint, we consider to be the advantage, the core differentiator of yeah. what we're doing. You don't have to give up anything to do that. So we can, of course, make smaller battery packs. It's always easier to go smaller. Okay. And we can go cheaper battery packs. We can even do swappable battery packs. We can do mm. all sorts of really cool stuff with battery, but we want to show what was fully capable in this footprint. Gotcha. I don't know if you've talked about this yet. What kind of batteries are you using? Just commercial off-the-shelf 2170s. Okay. Uh, but we have proprietary connectivity for electrical connections of our battery pack, proprietary thermal connectivity for our battery pack. Interesting. And those things together make our battery pack extremely space efficient. So are you planning on building these nearby? Because our expertise is in battery and safety technology, what we will do ourselves is the battery, the chassis, the crash structure, the ADAS system. Gotcha. That's, that's what we do. That's our, that's our specialty. Okay. The rest of the vehicle is contract manufactured. I see. It's everything from suspension components. All of the drivetrain components are commercial off the shelf through a major tier one supplier that can sell directly to us. But we've got the, the really the, the ability to go inexpensively commercial off-the-shelf components that weren't even available just five years ago. Okay. So you can actually see the motors in here. It's a dual motor system? Dual motor, front and rear. We actually see a lot of the electronics underneath that pound, but our inverter wow. can now fit in the palm of your hands. And just wow. like just a couple of years ago, the inverter was, you know, this big to do the oh, same yeah. power. Are these the uh, production intent uh, tire sizes? Yes. What? 20, how big are these? So these are 27 inches tall. Oh, okay. They are smaller than like a Ford Bronco or like a Toyota mm. Tacoma's tires sure. by like uh, two to three inches. And that helps with efficiency, I'd assume. It does help with efficiency, but it also, so one of the things we do really uniquely, and you'll see it when you actually get in the vehicle. Okay. There exists other small trucks in other markets, like yeah. the k -truck, but a lot of them do what's called cab over vehicles. They sit on top of the front axle, and that has a lot of disadvantages. Mm -hmm. One, from a, from a driver perspective, it feels really bizarre to be sitting atop a vehicle rather than in a vehicle, and then it actually adds to the height of the vehicle, so it makes your frontal area bigger, right. less efficient of a vehicle, right. um, and it reduces your crash, your ability to actually add crash structures in front of yourself. So we wanted to make sure you do as you sat down and behind that front axle, but as far into the wheel well as possible. Okay. So this composite component is structural, and it actually is what defines the wheel well and how you ingress and egress the vehicle. I see. So that's really important in actually how we, we actually are able to package this whole thing together. The other mm -hmm. thing about cab over, it actually shrinks your battery size because it moves your wheels closer together. Ah, Smaller wheel true. base, worse performance. You get a lot of advantages doing this. What that does is it means that the wheel well is now a part of the vehicle structure. Mm -hmm. and Interesting. This is what defines how big a tire we can go. Gotcha. Because if you go too big on tire as you turn and go through the full travel of the suspension, right. you would hit the wheel well. Are you planning on this being a composite in the production For as the well? For the first 500 we do. That number we talked about like in our Discord channel, like first 500 is very much a handmade 
Right. right. Okay. The next 5,000 will very likely um, do something more akin to casting of these. Okay. So that first 500 probably come in like in 2024, 2025? Definitely not 24. Right. Yeah. Um, we'll start... Unless you're really accelerating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're intending to start shipping them in 25. Okay. Gotcha. That's the timeline. How about in regards to software? There's a lot of people interested in CarPlay, Android Auto. Or are you yep. trying to do that? Everything's going to be off the shelf and it'll have CarPlay Auto. Auto. When the advantage is in not doing our own, doing only what we do best is that mm -hmm. you get to use a lot of off-the-shelf stuff. People are sure. used to Auto, Android Auto and CarPlay, and so that is actually yeah. available as an off-the-shelf component. Good. Kind of a big question. You brought up the production, taking your time a little bit, starting a somewhat low Some volume. Some might say the opposite we were doing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm curious about that just because watching so many other EV startups in the field, it doesn't feel like most of them have that mindset that you can start slow. It feels like lots of people are all saying that the only way this works is if you hit really high volume very quickly and yeah. some people start too slow and that can bankrupt them. So what's kind of the intentionality behind like you found a way to do it slowly. That's exactly right. There's a graveyard of electric vehicle companies yeah, over the definitely. last 20 years that followed on the Tesla. And a lot of them made the same kind of mistake trying to run before they walked and crawled, we mm -hmm. feel. You've seen that vehicles are made out of big stamped aluminum sheets. Sure. Mm -hmm. There's two different ways to actually do that. There's something called soft tooling and hard tooling. Hard tooling is when you make that entire like mold out of really hard steel. Mm -hmm. And those can make a million vehicles, no mm -hmm. problem. Soft tooling is when you make it out of a very soft material that can make 500 to 1,000 vehicles. But soft tooling costs one one hundred gotcha. of hard tooling. We're talking about a million dollars per tool for uh -huh. all the toolings versus a hundred million dollars for all the tools. Interesting. There's a lot of decisions that you can make like that when you're looking at high volume that you can justify because you can amortize it over time. But if you're not able to actually get to that high volume production, you just it just burned a hole in your pocket. All right. Your a lot of EV companies raised money when money was a lot easier. Their investors told them you have to go big. Mm. And they said, we're going big. Like they'll only invest if it's a next well, big thing. Well, right? no, they, they invested, but they also said like, we're giving you the money so you can go big. Oh, gotcha. And then when money became harder to get, which is right in, the, in the situation we're in right now, now that they can't actually fulfill the, the, the promises they gave. Mm. So they're, they're burning through a ton of capital every single month just to stay afloat, do that stuff. Tesla started small. They shipped 1,200 Roadsters. Mm. You know, they, they found a way to do it and they could do it because mm -hmm. they worked with the country manufacturer, Lotus at the time, to right. actually get to that stage. And they moved on to the next stage of their company to go big after that. Gotcha. So it's, it's absolutely doable to build low volume production vehicles. Our plan is to get to profitability at 5,000 vehicles per year. Is that gotcha. where you'll take a little bit more responsibility of the product a little bit more with the suspension and all that? Everything kind of has a, a sliding scale, right? It's okay. not, there's no real big like jump into like, we're doing everything right. ourselves. You know, we're always gonna use contract manufacturing in some extent, mm -hmm. and just to how much we actually use it for the vehicle production. 5,000 vehicles in our financial model is where we break even. That's one tenth to one twentieth what most financial models for other vehicle companies. Yeah, have. I was gonna say, that's fairly low volume considering what everybody else usually has to hit. And that's not where we'll stop, Right, but that's right. where we break even. Are you assuming a $50,000 average selling price? Mm -hmm with that? Wow. The capital it seems to get this into production feels a lot less than what a traditional startup tends to require. It is. Are you still on the lookout for like everything else, like the body structure and you'll build that wherever it's cost effective yeah, basically? Yeah, and we have, you know, we're working on contracts and with all those places. You know, people in the Silicon in the Bay Area, they love to kind of like say how they, they know everything and are the smartest <laughs> yeah. in the world. You know, it's very common, but sure. the truth of the matter is Detroit does have a lot of really good backgrounds and they've been in the automotive industry for over a hundred oh, years. Oh yes, of course. So uh -huh. it, it, the truth of the matter is you can't downplay what Detroit is capable of doing these sure. days. So a lot of these components that we're talking about are coming from Detroit. Interesting. Because they have the ability to do that. We only really want to innovate where our innovation matters the most. So you're going to have a little bit more control as well, even in the early startup phase of the paint colors and all that you're going to offer and the different trims that you want to include as well. We were dabbling in that. I'd love, I mean, it was one of the questions we'll ask our Discord channel eventually, yeah. which was really, really good. So we actually have a way to actually take our Discord channel Certain emojis we tag these things that actually go into our system and like, oh good I want to get more into that. What <laughs> made you choose Discord and why? I was going to the gym with a buddy who was like running. He actually his his apartment flooded. Okay. Mm. And he created a Discord channel for his, everybody that like all those seven hundred residents in the apartment to like try to do it. And he and he was like a he's an AI and software engineer, so he like created all these tools and rope and plugins and everything mm -hmm. and automated all the process and was able to like tag things and auto email. So he huh. created this whole infrastructure for like Discord based on his it's kind of flooding. He's like, oh, I've got such good engagement. You know, I've got like a 99% like engagement range and like doing all these things to keep them engaged and keep them like the going. So we actually are getting our insurance plans. I'm like, 
we should do the same thing for our company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's like, all right, let's do it. So it just okay. literally, I took his like model he built for his flooded apartment and we brought it over and now it's our like way of actually integrating and talking to it's our It's an interesting oh, cool. concept and way to get feedback from the community who you're of course trying to make the vehicle for. Exactly. And they're able to just get their piece of the pie in and be like, well, if you tried this. Yeah. And then I think what's genius with what you guys do is you throw it right into whatever your engineering PLM. Yeah. yeah, basically everyone else, what they're doing, and then you put it down in the line and whenever they get to it, it's like, all right, is yeah. this something that we can include or not? And if so, is it worth it? Or should we just shelve it and go with something that is either equivalent or alternative or just skip over entirely? Yeah, and yeah. we've gotten lots of great ideas from our Discord channel. Like we loved the participation, but to answer your question, you initially asked colors. Uh, for the first vehicles, they'll, they'll be wrapped. So mm-hmm. you can choose your wrap colors. Oh, interesting. Because I was going to say, usually the paint shop is like one of the most expensive parts of the ramp up. So that your initial builds will just, they won't need that. Yep. Cool. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> cool. This okay. was actually where we started. Yeah. We started oh, yeah. in 2018, self-funding an electric motorcycle company. My, my co-founder, Forrest, who was on the original Tesla team, he started Mission Motors. Mm-hmm. And Mission Motors was one of the first motorcycle companies uh, in the Bay Area. Wow. Motorcycle he actually broke the land speed record for electric motorcycle. Um, <laughs> so fun. I met him because I was trying to, I had this thesis that we really needed a, a city motorcycle. Like right. we needed like a city motor, because like everywhere in Southeast Asia has them and it's yep. just such a more useful way to get around. Very but common. Maybe the thing that Americans are not transitioning to electric motorcycles is because they don't have the range and they're too big. It's only 300 pounds. It's less than 300 pounds. So this is 100 miles of highway range. Wow, that's pretty good. Pounds. So the idea was that we could do something super lightweight mm-hmm. and um, we could get people into it. It turned out that hypothesis was largely incorrect because Americans don't love electric motorcycles. No. About 5,000 in all of 2021. You know, it's yeah. really not a good market for us. Mm-hmm. So we decided that we were pivoting, but we had developed all this technology in the battery side for motorcycles and scooters and e-bikes that could make us build a really small vehicle super efficient. Mm. And these ideas, these concepts on different cars and things that we could build. And eventually we, we interviewed a bunch of people in LA and San Francisco. We heard at 90% of our participants that they wanted a mini truck. It's so yeah. many different use cases for it. Like there, some people were like motorcyclists themselves. And they were like, let's, I want to throw two bikes in the back, go to the track. And then I want to take it to my favorite coffee shop in the city. After yeah. That. Have an easy time parking. Exactly. What well, made you land on the three lines on the front, at least? Or is that just something so, that everyone kind of agreed upon in the Discord? Yes. Yeah, so, a more aesthetic look. <laughs> no, so this is this, this actually, we this is prior to Discord that we did a lot of these activities. Oh, okay. And you can see kind of some of our, our transitions on you know, this wall, too, like different designs we had. Oh, yeah, yeah. Through. And we even wow. had, uh, like, I don't know, like some famous, uh, multiple different big automotive designers come in. My co-founder had actually worked with an individual named Eve Bahar. Mm-hmm. before this launch. And I think you guys know who he is, but for your viewers who don't, sure, go ahead. he's the he's a world famous super designer. He did mm-hmm. like the Herman Miller chairs, one laptop per child, Jawbone, a yeah. bunch of other consumer products and commercial mm-hmm. products. Really, Forrest got to know him from, he's, that's Forrest, by the way. Hi, Forrest. Um, <laughs> hey, Forrest. Oh, and so Forrest got to know him from his time at the Mission Motors, because he launched Mission Motors, he did the design. Mm-hmm. And so he, we told Eve what we were doing, he's like, I don't want it. Uh, got, oh, got good. Part of this. So he did cool. a bunch of these early designs. Yeah. And we did we voted as a team with him and his organization, our organization. We we narrowed it down. We did some iterations and we came to the conclusion that we were this is the direction we were moving. Yeah. So we locked we locked in on that. Are those cool. different type of lights, like fog light, headlight, running light, or are they all just yep. running lights? They're, 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 they actually, so the running lights are the interior, and when you turn the brights, the whole thing gets really bright. Okay. Oh, okay. So I actually, okay. I don't have the product line up for those lights, but those lights actually work. And you can oh, nice. Oh, nice. Cool. So going down the shop, we have a fully functional shop in here, you know, very nice. much Silicon Valley startup y. But really the wow. thing I wanna kinda draw your attention to is the is the mold, the model. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, a fiberglass buck that we created that we wrapped. It's foam and fiberglass that we wrapped. Okay. It's a full size representation of what we'll actually build. Cool. Now our design is, you know, not hundred percent formal because we have some aerodynamic improvements to be made, but sure. for the most part it's, it's relatively locked in. Okay. The thing that we're doing that, that you asked about was the pale shape, right? Yeah, right. that's I'm curious about so it. So one thing that's really kind of interesting about what we're doing is we have exposed front wheels. And Even up here exposed, you mean? Like this, yeah. like everything from here is uh-huh. kind of exposed, right? Right. So you hit your tire. And the problem is that you get an air pocket that ends up sitting here and you get a high pressure zone mm. behind wow. the front tire. So what we'll have is a way to exhaust the high pressure zone through the vehicle. Oh, interesting. The vehicle. Surface. Okay. It's then, going through the door? Through the door. Wow. It's, uh, we wanted to really draw your eye to it because it's something relatively unique. You know, it's used in like Formula One to actually... Like they call it a barge board for the side of the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Like it's so unique in what we're doing. We wanted to really draw your attention to it and make it the defining factor of the vehicle from the side. 
and a lot of times vehicles are they use like sharp angles and they're like so like aggressive in the angles look and we wanted to kind of buck that trend in many ways sure so we had okay. very soft organic transitions and shells and then we have a really unique like almost sculptural element to the side yeah that really draws your eyes into it and you just carry that away along with the door handles then exactly oh yeah the, the lights the and tail lights and everything and what do you call this is that gear tunnel or is that yeah uh, it's a, I mean I don't know if Rivian calls it gear tunnel not sure there's a patent on that name. yeah I don't know the answer to that but it, it is a storage location okay we call and it the has, tello tunnel yep <laughs> it has over six cubic feet of storage on wow. the side and then the cool thing is from the bed itself you can access the gear tunnel and you wow. can lift it up oh that's cool then you can have a third row of seats in the back Okay, I have a ton of questions about that. Is that like an accessory that people, you're assuming they'll be able to get after they've already taken delivery of a truck? I mean, you can probably order it during at time of delivery if it, when it's available. Gotcha. Yes. And then will that be in, enclosed as well? In, for US a, regulations, it'll need to be. It has to be, gotcha. And but I mean, this, if you go on the beach, there's no, you know, you could have it open. Right, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of convertible for the third row. Will there be additional airbags required for that? Or is third row kind of fair game for aftermarket? So there are regulations around how you deal with the third row safety, but a lot of that has to do with side of your head impacting the oh. uh, glass itself. Okay. So there, that, that can be handled through airbags or it can be handled in other ways. Are you kind of decided yet on if you want to go the airbag route or the... We won't go airbags on the third row, but okay. we will meet that requirement regardless. Gotcha. It'll be safe. <laughs> It'll be safe. Yeah, I know you have a big safety background. Exactly. And I had a lot of questions about that in regards to... At least my gut reaction, which I'm curious to learn more about, so just like this. It's like, as soon as you provided that answer, I go, that makes a lot of sense. That means I, I welcome it because it's no longer a mystery. My gut reaction was with this very short, like how forward the yeah. driver is sitting. That crumple zone seems narrower than a traditional vehicle. I'm guessing there's, with your background, a lot more meaning to it than yeah. just that. And that's kind of special sauce as to how we go. And we're going to announce a lot of stuff and show videos of crash testings and okay. simulations cool. in the near future, so I won't give you the whole That's fair. story. You can, but you what can I will hold. is I'll hint at it. Your heel sit about here. Mm -hmm. So you have about 18 inches of unobtrusive crumple zone still in this vehicle. So okay. there does exist 18 inches of crumple zone. Okay. And the nice thing about the way the crumple zone actually works is that everything that's in this space, that's mechanical, electrical, everything, crushes underneath the vehicle. So you, that that eighteen inches is is unobtrusive. It's, it goes. You can go flat all wow. the way flat up to the all, all the way up to the firewall. Like a soda can. Exactly. Even better. So soda <laughs> even can, better. Soda can still has like an accordion feature and it leaves you like good like compressible material. Yeah. This gotcha. will this will tuck away the entirety of the crash structure underneath. Wow. So you have will have no almost no in, uh, incompressible material that's left over. So you get the you get an unobtrusive crump, crumple zone in that way. Wow. Okay. So that's that's kind of core to what we're doing there. But on top of that, there are ways in which that that you actually can look at the science of the crash. So a lot of people think about crash safety, they think about, okay, if I put an accelerator accelerometer on this chassis, mm -hmm. it crashed, that's my crumple zone. That's, that's what matters, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but what really matters is what is the change in acceleration of your head and your heart? Because mm -hmm. that's what causes damage to you in, in, in the crash. Actually. I see. If intrusion and head and heart, that's what matters. Yeah. So we have a very strong firewall, no intrusion. We actually look at the way you actually crash. And we do things like, we use sensors to detect collisions before they happen, and we anticipate the collision, and we do things in the vehicle to actually make that crash itself safer. Wow. To slow down the change in acceleration of your head and your heart over time. The middle headlight is... So is... all three of them are running, both all running lights, and they turn brights on. So they you gotcha. can kind of see that there's a bright and then a strip around the edge. So the whole thing gets really bright when it turns the brights on. Oh, and then it gotcha. The, the middle light comes on. Just really just the show lights, like the actual headlights are, will have much different... You know, yeah, yeah. exactly be the internals of those. Yeah, but it will have the same aesthetic. What made you land on three lights? Just luminosity required or no. No. just that design? The aesthetic. So okay, the just design. ease. Would you say your goal is kind of to be the most, the most efficient pickup Correct. ever made? Exactly. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> those those are exactly fan. the words I use. Okay. Yep. I will... and, and it's both space efficiency. Yes. Uh, electrical efficiency. Sure. So how many watt hours are required to drive a mile with the vehicle? Wow. Yeah, based on your website, basically, you're targeting three and a half miles per kilowatt hour. That's unheard of in the truck space. That That's pretty impressive. I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, legal requirements and regulations involved, especially with a four-wheel vehicle. We've been doing a lot of uh, research on Aptera and they're hoping to skip a lot of that regulation by doing vehicle. three. Is that a concern or like, how do you manage bringing 
that so that's market. Exactly, you're exactly right. You're hitting the ball in the head. That's, that's the next major milestone in our company. Yeah. Is being able to show NHTSA, National Highway Traffic Safety Association's Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards that we've hit them. Okay. So Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards are what defines... If you're an automaker, you have to meet all of them. And you have to submit all your paperwork. It's an encyclopedia worth of paperwork. But it really is your job to make sure you go do that. Uh -huh. They're not combing over every single detail that you've done. So what happens is if you, something bad happens and you get sued, you have to be able to defend gotcha. that you've done that. I see. So of federal motor vehicle safety standards, there's, a, like I said, a ton of them. The ones that really stand out to us as the ones that get people hung up for the most part are FMVSS 208. And 214, mm -hmm. frontal crash and side crash. Mm. So we've already started the process of doing validation and simulation of 208 and 214 okay. to actually prove that we can do this in our vehicle. Good. And good. once you get past those hurdles, the rest is just a lot of checking in the box. Did you do this right? Did you do this right? Did right. you do this right? And going through that process. Do you have like a target uh, curb weight in mind? Yeah, 4,400 pounds. Wow. Yeah, that's not bad. That's in line with, I mean, that's lighter than some Model Ys. Much lighter than Model yeah. Ys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we want to, I mean, it's lighter than my Tacoma. Being a truck owner myself, I have a brand 1500. I do a bit of towing as well with horses and all that. I didn't see any towing estimations on your site and all that and which by the way the site's hilariously amazingly set up just to be one page that's awesome <laughs> but on that page i didn't see any mentions of towing estimations so is that something it. that you're thinking of so we'll have the ability to tow like 6600 pounds no problem oh okay um, he's pretty up there but the thing you should know about electric vehicles and towing yeah oh we that, know. <laughs> and back to the aerodynamics that you, we were just discussing yeah when, so when you're towing a yeah when you're towing a vehicle you add some rolling distance but you have a ton of aerodynamic resistance right yep a big freaking block with a huge funnel area throws everything off throws everything off yeah so mm -hmm. when people like sit there and complain like they're getting really poor uh mileage while towing like yeah that makes sense from which is why coming back to the story around when you're competing against other large pickup trucks who built their brand around towing horses, for example, mm -hmm. you're going to have a lot of trouble in that same because you're not going to be able to meet all the needs that somebody has if they're towing. So sure. yes, you can use our vehicle for towing, but it's really more likely going to be used for like, take your boat out of the water and bring it to its thing rather than towing across country. Oh yeah, definitely not long haul, but short haul. That was something I was a little bit more interested in because yeah. of course, if I were to buy one, I'm not going to take it all the way to the East Coast in like three days or something like that. It's going to mm -hmm. be a whole month excursion most likely just mm -hmm. to enjoy the sights and all that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I was just more curious along the lines of can it tow in which it's got the power for it and how much and what are you willing to support with it something like the plugs for it as well just to make sure that you can tow is that something yep, that absolutely you everything definitely include? Yeah. okay and we so i have an airstream it's like 5300 pounds right and so that uh, it will have to tow that and yeah. <laughs> and 6600 you know yeah that's a requirement is there a priority for a certain number of outlets like plugging in accessories or? It's probably something we'll ask our Discord channel and see what oh, they okay. back with. Join so you can vote. <laughs> Make yeah. sure they get what you want. And a lot of radical new designs have to compromise on this, although I don't find it as a deal breaker. Is there a frunk? No frunk. Okay. All right. We'll learn to live with it. <laughs> to be fair, I don't think it needs a frunk. True. There's a lot of a gear tunnel and a whole bunch. I mean, and it's the size of a Toyota yeah. Tacoma, basically, on the interior yeah. and the bed space, right? I don't use my frunk in my Tacoma. That's... I hope not. <laughs> Although rats can use his frunk. Yeah. Oh jeez. <laughs> no, I, um, my wife really didn't like using the frunk because mm -hmm. whenever she would uh, pop the hood to use it, like guys would pull over on the freeway and be like, "Oh, do you need help?" Oh jeez. Oh, <laughs> so like it happened quite often that she's like, "I don't really want to store stuff wow. in there because people just like want That's to talk funny. to me." And Interesting. To not heard so that. So what's in that space? Uh, so you guys see it up here? I wouldn't call it a production intent. It oh okay. A, a lot of the components that we will use but they aren't necessarily in their final position. Okay, is there anything you can point out like we're not quite sure where this is gonna be yet? Well, first or... off, this is way too big a radiator. Sure, that's <laughs> my so first thought. Nice. It's like, ah. Uh... Every single person that's seen this is like, why is your radiator so big? Yeah. Uh, we joke, we joke, because our engineers are very much engineers who are like, we're gonna overspec this in case we're gonna it <laughs> yeah. with it. And we're just like, right. like, this is like three times, four times the size of radiator. Yeah, <laughs> good for the prototype. Well, the nice thing about having a giant radiator though is you, you never have to turn the fan on. Oh, <laughs> so, good. It's so big that like, it yeah. doesn't need a fan. It's just all the air cooling. And wow. Do you have a peak charge speed kind of picked out yet? Yeah. I mean, we're capable of doing what we call 3C. 3C. So okay. 3C. So 300 almost. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, that's our, our battery is capable of handling that. Okay. So which wow. means that theor a theoretical charge in, in 20 minutes. What really the reaction in actuality is more like from 10 to 85% you can do it in 20 minutes. Wow. I'm, I was happy to hear you guys want to use NAX. Yes. That's a very good decision. And we'll be um, NACS uh, native. Yes, next. 
right? And, mm -hmm. But uh, we won't need an adapter. Good. Yeah. If that saves a lot of hassle. Are you guys thinking about doing anything with that plug as well? Trying to do like bi-directional charging or anything so, like that so for workers on the job site? From the standard that is published online that they kind of shared, that they do have the ability to do bi-directional. And their Cybertruck uh, apparently has that built in now in, yep. their, in yep. their version. So mm -hmm. we'll be using just, just what they provide to okay. us okay. off, off the shelf. Where does that stand for your... Uh, High voltage battery system is at four hundred volts on this. Yeah. So the reason that we for this first batch of vehicles we're using four hundred volts. Okay. And the reason that we're using four hundred volts is because a lot of the components are available commercially off the shelf for four hundred volts. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Eight hundred volt architecture isn't quite there yet. The cost of an inverter for eight hundred volts is about two to three times as expensive right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Plus, you'll be able to just plug into the existing V threes, and you don't have to split any pack voltages yeah. or anything. What's okay. your turning radius you're targeting? So sub 40 feet, um, this okay. version you'll notice is a, we limited it mechanically sure. to mm -hmm. avoid any structural damage on the vehicle. Yeah, that's So it, this version has about 45 feet, but you'll, you'll, it's definitely going to be a sub 40 feet. Are you guys in kind of the funding dependent zone or? We're not using any of the money from our pre-orders. That's all held okay. in escrow. Good, good. So that, so yes, we are obviously then. Sure. You know, dependent on outside investment. And we, we you know, you can see online, we've we closed a $1.6 million pre-seed round and we're opening up a seed round right now. Gotcha. So you, are you kind of hoping to stay semi-public until deliveries begin and then IPO, or is that... Yeah, I mean, like, IPO is not even, like, on the docket for on our, kind of, uh, our, what we're looking at. Like, cool, we want to cool. create value. We want to bring vehicles in customers' hands. Yeah. You know, that's really what we want to do. We think there's, it was a mistake, IPO before customers' deliveries for a lot of other companies. Yes, I agree. Um, so we're definitely, that's not on our agenda. Good. I think that's fair. Yeah, and SPACs are, were the trend of the, you know... Couple years back and yeah it's tough because those actually have clawback provisions that on your stock and you could really have some like you could take the company very like overnight if things don't go right right yeah i don't want to do that well what are you guys interested in hearing about me i know i've told this to mike on several podcasts i kept saying everybody's wanting pickup trucks and three row SUVs. And you both. I was like, there's way too many similarities between those two vehicles. Why has no one tried to yeah, do like I a hybrid? This, fundamentally, this is the third row. Yeah. <laughs> You've got that little. I love that you can access the tunnel from yep, the this, bed, this too. Is the footwell. That's a huge Obviously advantage. Obviously, you sit up a little higher to the back here. A huge interest for me definitely came from it felt like most of America was obsessed with tanks. And I'm nervous by how it doesn't seem to be stopping. It's yeah. just like every year there's more and more push, make it bigger, bigger, bigger. You know, you don't see that in other countries, which I feel like is direct evidence of everything you told us about the EPA in the 70s and how they didn't have those same rules and laws overseas. So that's why you see trucks at different scale. It's not like they're not getting work done right. overseas. They're still productive yeah. and they still got projects and they still got to load up stuff. They just make it work in a smaller form factor. Yeah, so. Japan's government incentivized the exact opposite, right? Oh, great. They, they, they <laughs> actually put government incentives to build K-trucks. Wow. Got. Yes, I've seen many of those overseas. There's actually a government incentive. This is actually started. It's, it's not so much anymore, but it yeah. started as a big tax break. If you bought wow. these vehicles, you huh. get a huge tax break over other vehicles on the road. Yeah. I like the fact that you guys have models everywhere of everything that you're trying <laughs> to compare. Like you got your own little small tele truck right next to a cyber truck right here. Oh, that's cool. And you got fifty. Looks like an F one fifty. Garbage. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. I just appreciate wow. the fact that it's a small truck that is still capable of doing everything that a usual mid sized truck can do, if not a bigger one. As someone who owns a Ram fifteen hundred, kind of stifled towing capacity and payload capacity. I'm not using it for any super heavy duty stuff. Yeah. And this is equal. I think it's more utility focus than my truck at home, which is just baffling in terms of the size that you're packaging everything into. Yeah. Well, you guys want to go for a ride? We'd love I'd to. love to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I'm assuming that you guys are still thinking about what the final seat will look yeah, like. Yeah, the seat location is correct. Okay. Like, so this leg room, this head room. Are you aiming for heated and cool seats or? Front will do, definitely do heated seats for sure. Okay. Ventilated most likely as well. Okay. Um, as opposed to doing straight cooling because uh, I feel like airflow is better than just. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Conducive. The rear we probably won't, but we haven't decided. It has the, me the mechanism that needs to be out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this has the full flow. Okay. Well, thanks again, you guys, for showing us around, for sure. answering all our questions. We're very excited for the future and uh, hope production 
go smoothly. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone supporting, and we hope you have an excellent rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.